few days in, and we were starting to uh, stand up in front of the class a little bit longer. So it wasn't just the start of the flow. It was like a, we were starting to link together maybe the first three moves that you do in yoga. And I felt like I was a record player, like I was <laughs> reading off a script. And he was like, whoa, just like, wait, like, pause, like slow down, slow down, let it just come to you. It doesn't have to be, you know, always a sweep up and a fold, high plank, low plank. Like it doesn't always have to be the same rhythm. And he sort of inter interrupted me and I just gathered myself and just sort of let go of the firm grip on the practice that I had been in for years going to your class to just allow whatever came out in front of that class to flow. That takes trust, vulnerability, big, big letting go, big letting go. Is my mind tuned to the noise or is my mind tuned to silence? Because if silence feels uncomfortable or foreign, that's just because the mind is not tuned to silence. So there's silence in between every word that I'm speaking, any sound, any noise arises and fades into silence. There's space between the waves breaking on shore. There's silence in between the notes of a musical piece. There's silence everywhere. You don't just attune to it actually helps a lot when you don't just attune to it in your meditation, but throughout the day, look for the silence. Like there's silence in between somebody beeping at you. There's stillness in there. There's silence in there. So our minds are tuned to the noise of life. This is how most of us live. And sometimes there's quiet, but we can also tune our minds to the silence of life. And then life becomes balanced. It feels more balanced because you're seeing as much silence and stillness as you are noise. And at any time, because you have well-worn pathways, you can lean into either whatever serves you the best. Welcome to the Yogi Triathlete Podcast. I'm Jess. I'm here with Beej, and this is our November Osho. Um, this is actually going to launch the day before our 20th wedding anniversary. It's not wild. It's so wild. So 20, we'll, I know, 20. 20 years. So we'll get into that, but welcome to the show. Let's start with that. Welcome to the show. Also, big shout out um, to our Patreon supporters that make this show possible. Like, without you guys, this show would... The show would not be happening. <laughs> we were, was it last night or this morning? We were, I was saying like, I think it was this morning when we were launching today's show, which was episode 340. I was like, wow, like we have shown up for this podcast. And there was one week that we missed in 340 episodes. And it was uh, right at the beginning, like not that many weeks into even having the podcast. Um, and it was the day after my sister's wedding and three days before we were about to move into our car. And I remember like, it was actually pretty profound, but I, for me at the time to give myself that, like that permission to be like, I'm not gonna come home from my sister's wedding and edit a podcast because it was taking me so long to do because I didn't know what I was doing. And so yeah, so 300, I don't know what this will be. So this will be like, what, 342 or something like that. But wow, it's amazing. So we do talk about showing up and consistency and how important that is. And um, and yeah, I think we've seen it with just the flow of guests and the growth of the audience, the listeners, you guys. But yeah, so thank you to our Patreon supporters because this wouldn't exist without you. It just, it wouldn't. Um, it keeps it commercial free, but more so than that, it keeps it going. So if you are a listener and you're taking some good away from this, you know, from little as $5 a month, you can help us continue to grow it and continue to show up every week for it. So anything else you want to say as we lead into this episode that we've really no idea what we're going to talk about, I, I which love, I love so right. much. Just that listening to Philip or so, our, your yoga teacher, um, 
or guide, I guess you should say, or you're a spiritual leader that you walked into his studio and was like, that's your guy. Um, also was my yoga teacher, uh, training teacher. I listened to one of their classes and actually practiced to it. And he talked about that very thing that we're doing right now, which is make the make the known unknown and make the certain uncertain. And this would normally freak me out, you know, being on a podcast, hosting a podcast, co-hosting a podcast and not having an agenda or standing up in front of a yoga classroom and knowing the flow by heart because I practice, but not being able to actually instruct it to others really can be a, a paralyzing experience. Can you remember something in, uh, in yoga teacher training where he was teaching you to like trust the present moment? Do I remember a moment when he said that? Yeah. Oh yeah. Or when you were learning it? Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. What was that moment? Uh, well, I think it was, I don't know, a few days in and we were starting to, uh, stand up in front of the class a little bit longer. So it wasn't just the start of the flow. It was like, uh, we were starting to link together maybe the first three moves that you do in yoga. And I felt like I was a record player. Like I was (laughs) reading off a script and he was like, Whoa, just like, wait, like, pause, like slow down, slow down, let it just come to you. It doesn't have to be, you know, always a sweep up and a fold, high plank, low plank. Like it doesn't always have to be the same rhythm. And he sort of interrupted me and I just gathered myself and just sort of let go of the firm grip on the practice that I had been in for years going to your class to just allow whatever came out in front of that class to flow. That takes trust vulnerability, big, big letting go, big letting go. Yeah. And just thinking about in Awake Athlete, we are reading through the Gita and in chapter seven that we're reading right now, it talks about jnana and viyana. So jnana is like, um, and then there's another word that they use. It starts with an A and I can't remember it off the top of my head, but it's, it's basically about experience, right? So the word that I can't remember is like ignorance. Like you don't even know about this power flow, right? And then there's Guiana, which is like, you had been to my classes for years. And so you knew what it looked like for me to teach. I would go in, I would, you know, make sure the heat and the steam were good. I'd be checking the humidity. I'd be greeting students. You'd be setting it. So you knew, right? Like you had that Guiana, you had that knowledge of what it was like to teach a class. And then you went to te- yoga teacher training, right? Um, maybe a little part of you was like, oh yeah, like I'm going to nail this because I've been going to this class and doing this flow for years. And then you step into Viana, which is direct experience as a teacher. And so it discerns these levels of knowledge from ignorance to direct experience um, because it's, it's so different of just knowing about it and observing it than actually doing it. Same thing with reading a book. You can read as many books as you want, but if you're not putting that learning from the book into practice, then you're just always going to be reading the book. So I'm always going to be practicing to your class. I'm never really going to experience what it's like to be in front of a classroom and try to teach what I've been practicing to from you. You got to be put into that environment of not knowing. What do you think was like the biggest transformative piece for you becoming a yoga teacher? Just the first thing, yeah, like the first thing that comes to mind because it's, it's, there's so many things I think with that teacher training, but like, what's the one thing? Be myself, like Mm. be myself, be myself. And what does that feel like? (laughs) It feels, it felt uncomfortable at first. (laughs) Like, very uncomfortable. <laughs> I knew a lot of these people too. I knew them through yoga. Uh, so yeah, that was like being vulnerable, extremely vulnerable. But that was where, man, it was so challenging to hear your voice on the recording because you would record your voice. But that was the the really pivotal moment where you just can laugh it off, right? It's just, it's just your voice. It's just a recording. And it's great. That's, that was my growth journey. That was a one step along my, the path to growth, to becoming more of myself. That's all it is. So if we keep taking these moments that we experience in life and not give them so much 
value that it's who we are, that it's just a little piece along the way to our growth, then then we're gonna we're gonna progress much quicker. We're not gonna be lugging, you know, hanging on to this baggage. Um, what did Lucho say? The carousel of baggage he's got <laughs> behind him. Uh, I think it's really that's not to get too deep into live, love, teach, but that's why I believe I'm able to compose my thoughts and speak at this level to all of you and to do these lives on Instagram and to teach yoga. It's why I'm able to do that confidently, 100%. Uh, For me, because we had the same exercise, we would record ourselves teaching and then we'd like go off into the yard and, you know, and uh, we were to listen to it. And I, it took me a while to be able to laugh it off. Like took me a long time to be able to laugh it off uh, years. But for me, the shocker was just because I knew the message was like to be yourself takes no effort. And that like didn't compute because it took so much effort to be me. Like, who was I talking to? Like, what did I need to be knowledgeable about when I was going out with these people or if it was business or whatever, even at yoga teacher training? And so what I heard on those recordings, which was so painful to hear, was how how much I was trying to be something, a yoga teacher, to be spiritual, to be the best, to be trying so hard to be something. And oh, it was like, oh, it was blah. It was awful to listen to. It was so hard to listen to it. But I think that was like a growth spurt in releasing judgment and just noticing the judgment and just feeling how awful I felt about myself, how much like I hated the exercise. I hated how bad I was. I hated how badly I wanted to be the best, like all of it. But that just strips away everything. An experience like that, an exercise like that strips away everything um, that keeps you from being who you are. You know, we've even had podcast guests We've had a couple of professional athletes on this show that have not listened to their podcast that we had them on because they can't, they just haven't been able to listen to their voice. And so, you know, I would love to be like, come on over, let's do it together. <laughs> we'll just, or we'll send you out in the yard and you can just listen to it and you can breathe when you're feeling all the things. So it's not easy. And then it was, that was a, that was years and years and years process of, of letting go of that judgment. I know you have the same thing, even as you started the podcast, listening to your voice on the podcast, but now you listen to the podcast every week because you're the one that pulls out the quotes. Is it getting easier for you? Yeah, it's not a big deal. I joke about it more often now. It's not a big deal. I, it's just work. And a thought just came to me as you were talking I was standing in front of the class and it was easy as I was beginning to do this teacher training to receive feedback that was like, oh yeah, we like this, we like this, we like this, right? And so the ego liked that and I was like, oh yeah, because I've been practicing. But it was that one person in that teacher training that would say, you could have done, and immediately your defenses, you feel that defenseness go up, right? That I, I, you don't know me. Like I've been practicing, you know, whatever my uh, record is, but I was onto it enough to say like, okay, like this is the opportunity to learn. This is where you have to be defenseless. This is when you turn the dial 180 and instead of getting all worked up and feeling that swirly sensation, you welcome it in and you say, oh, how can I learn? How can I take, how can I take growth from this? What is this person? They're not attacking me. They're, they're pointing out an opportunity for me. So when I listen to the podcast myself, back to what you were saying, I, I hear that. I hear the words. And there's one I'm working on now, actually. I say actually, way overuse the word actually, in my opinion, from what I'm hearing on the podcast, what I'm hearing on my lives. So it's a slowing down and choosing your words carefully. So when that word comes up, you can pause and maybe select a different word. And that is that moment that you can shift and change what you're going to say. Because that's just a habit actually has become a least action pathway. So whether it's the word 
actually, whether it's self-judgment, whether it's negative self-talk, it's the, the, the gold is in the gap. The gold is getting into that space where you are slowing down. And it's not just waking up on a Monday and being like, all of a sudden I'm going to slow down. And <laughs> for sure that can be an intention that's wonderful and be mindful. But I think that slowing down happens, I mean, for us, I'll speak for you too, is that it's happened over the course of years from sitting sitting in stillness and not getting up and not itching the itch and and being there when the mind's like, oh, maybe the timer, did the timer go off? Maybe it didn't go off because it didn't go off that one time. And then I checked and it was really good that I checked. And then, and then, and this happens all the time. It happened to me the other day. And finally I was like, yeah, it does seem like a long time. And I looked and it had gone off, but I didn't hear it. That will happen. Um, I always think like, oh, I must've been actually meditating when that happened. But that slowing down does allow you to see the words as they're coming down the pike. And you can choose a new one, but you got to get, you got to get out ahead of it. And it's a process. At the same time, right? Like you're slowing down, but you, but as a result, you get out ahead of your thoughts. It's pretty cool. It is a cool, it is a cool experience to have. Because I don't have the words a lot of times, that alternative word. So I can like, my brain is working overtime to go through its library to find the word that it's trying to say. And so I may stumble a bit for these first few weeks, months, however long. So having not a firm grip on, it's got to be perfect. Like all of a sudden I'm going to have the words to use. I'm not. I'm repatterning myself to find a new word and not use that word over and over again, find alternative words and phrases and ways that I can work the message around. And then it gets super exciting because then you really don't know what you're going to say or how it's going to come out. That's a pretty exciting place to be. And in those moments where you're looking for the new word, there's like a pause. And I think, I don't think, I know that that was also something we learned in yoga teacher training was like, do not speak until the words arise and we were taught to, you know, walk out in front of the class and just wait, like wait for people to stop their, you know, chatter, which is so awesome. A community coming together, like sometimes those Sunday morning classes that I used to teach, it was like crazy loud, everybody reconnecting, you know, after a week, it was a big class and just waiting and making eye contact with people, but not speaking, it creates such discomfort but that's just because silence has been has become a pathway of discomfort for us. Not for you and me. No, but over over time, over time. that has been cultivated. Where were we? We were just walking today through town and we were I noticed we were just we hadn't said a word. It was so nice. Well, I recall <laughs> the journey across the country when we didn't really listen to podcasts or music and we just sat in silence for a long period of time. So the silence is okay. It's okay. It's completely acceptable. Once you get comfortable in the silence, it's okay. Until you get comfortable in the silence, it doesn't feel that good. You don't have to fill the space. But it's a great question to ask yourself, whoever's listening, is my mind tuned to the noise or is my mind tuned to silence? Because if silence feels uncomfortable or foreign, that's just because the mind is not tuned to silence. So there's silence in between every word that I'm speaking, any sound, any noise arises and fades into silence. There's space between the waves breaking on shore. There's silence in between the notes of a musical piece. There's silence everywhere. You don't just attune to it actually helps a lot when you don't just attune to it in your meditation, but throughout the day, look for the silence. Like there's silence in between somebody beeping at you. There's stillness in there. There's silence in there. So our minds are tuned to the noise of life. This is how most of us live. And sometimes there's quiet, 
but we can also tune our minds to the silence of life and then becomes more of a, like life becomes balanced. It feels more balanced because you're seeing as much silence and stillness as you are noise. And at any time, because you have well-worn pathways, you can lean into either whatever serves you the best. Yeah, I think that experience we had this morning when we turned off the fan and you heard the wind blowing the, the palm trees were hitting, hitting each other. And then they were getting a little bit crazy and wild because they were tapping together quickly like somebody was actually forcefully doing it. Or, but they were just acting in the wind and that's the only noise we heard today. And then the other day, was that Sunday or Saturday, we did the same thing and you could hear the waves waves of the ocean crash. And so the silence created that. And if we were, had the fan on or we're talking, or plugged in, we wouldn't have heard those things. So the silence actually sifted through the silence to allow for the noise, if that makes sense, the noise to come through of the waves crashing or the palm trees tapping each other. And those are moments that can quickly go by without even a blink of an eye, not even realizing that's what's happening. Not even seeing those things. Monday mornings, we teach yoga at 7 a.m. Pacific time. And so we wake up at, we used to wake up at 5, but then I've started waking us up at 4.30 because that 4.30 wake up gives us time to sit in bed in the dark. We typically have a fan on for white noise. We like that at night and also just keep air moving We'll turn the fan off and we'll just like listen and we won't really even speak. And we'll take, I mean, sometimes like 15, 20 minutes just to kind of wake up into the day, which is, I love that. I would much rather get up half an hour early than feel like I didn't leave enough time before we're stepping in to teach yoga, right? Like this is what we do to teach yoga and yoga is, is about yoking the mind, It's about bringing together. Um, It's the science of the mind. So I say it's like yoking the mind, right? Steering it for a purposeful life, really. And um, so we don't want to be coming into class like hot, you know, like, oh my God, rushing around. It's not even 7 a.m. yet. So I love that extra time in the morning. Well, relating that to, I was just thinking, relating that to workouts and as athletes, especially getting to the pool. We're like rushed to get to the pool. And we're like, like you said, coming in hot to the parking lot. We're grabbing our swim gear. We're going past the front desk. We're changing in the locker room. We, we get in there and we got to share a lane. And you're already in this energy of rushing. You're not calm. Your system is not calm. You may think you're calm, but your system is in a rush. Like you got there. And then you see the set and you got to rush through the set because you've got a limited number, uh, limited amount of time. And so this whole experience is rushed. So no, no wonder people who swim feel anxiousness. They feel pressure. They feel a lack of confidence in the water. What is your prep going into a swim? What is, what is it like when you roll up to the pool? You know, that just there, getting up a half an hour early, does that allow you to prepare, get your swim bag, drive to the pool a little bit early, even though it doesn't open yet, so that you can calm yourself in the car, take a few breaths? I've been thinking about this as I do my Saturday long rides and we drive out to Escondido, getting up early and getting the water bottles prepped and everything done and put in a bag. So all I have to do is carry out three bags into the car and just because it takes 30 minutes to get to where I need to go doesn't mean I leave 30 minutes before I need to be there, right? This is the same, I love this realization you had, the same thing about speed. Just because the speed limit is 75 doesn't mean you have to go 75. Yeah, it's not a minimum, it's a maximum. Right, you can go 70, you can go 58, right? But that would cause... I'm assuming and guessing that would cause a frustration in others with you driving at that speed. It could, and it, and it has. And 
I've also been the crazy person behind the car. Like, make no mistake. I used to drive like 100 everywhere I went. I was a crazy driver, aggro, aggressive. Um, but um, but I've shifted that. <laughs> I've shifted that, thank God, <laughs> to the safety of myself and those around me on the road. Um, but yeah, I mean, of course it's not all people, right? Like some people love to swim and that's their meditate. That's they feel is you know, their meditation. But as we talk more and more with age group athletes, um, there is resistance to the swim, like getting to the pool. I don't know what it is. I mean, I do know what it is. At least for me, it was like this belief system. I actually did a, a podcast in Awake Athlete. I think it was season three about this. Like I had, I started to examine this belief about the pool about like, oh, well, it's not just an hour workout. I got to drive there and then I get a shower there. And then by the time I leave and get home and it's like three hours and all that. And I started to just really look at that and be like, do you have to shower? You don't really have to shower there. You could just get in the car because I was showering there and then I was coming home and showering again. So there was just all these different things like, okay, where can, where can I be more efficient? And also is this belief that you have, which is kind of putting a damper on your motivation to get to the pool is it true? And then when I looked at it, it really wasn't true at all. The time in my mind was not the actual time that it took to get to the pool, get a swim in and get back. And, you know, sometimes like on our Thursday swims, like you and I take time. And I mean, I've been in the hot tub for like 30 minutes. Like that has been like three, three and a half hour workouts uh, before. But I guess it's, it's looking at, um, I love this question, like, if you're feeling anxious about something or you're feeling hesitant or you're feeling like, Oh, I have to do this. I hate running or, um, you know, I'm scared of biking on the road, things like that. To get underneath the belief, a great question to ask yourself is what do I need to believe in order to feel this way? And that's a, that's a great question to look at. And then you get to the belief and then you can take that belief into your everyday life and see if that belief is true. Yeah, good question to ask. I think I think what we're addressing here is creating that or finding that space between a habit that probably isn't serving us to something that is better for our growth. You know, we talked about yoga, teaching yoga, finding words. We talked about getting to the pool in a calm state. I think it's slowing down. There's a great book by Eknatha Swaran, who is one of our teacher's teachers, and he actually wrote the translation of the Bhagavad Gita that we're studying, but it's, I believe it's called The Art of Slowing Down. It's a very small little book. It's wonderful because he, he grew up in India, and I'm pretty sure he was in uh, New York City, but he had like a big job and was like driving and, you know, just doing the thing, doing the grind, all this stuff. And, and then, um, yeah, like big university professor, very, you know, highly esteemed um, man of his field. And, uh, and yeah, he just one day just kind of wondered like where, like why, why we were all moving so fast it's a it's a great book. I uh, highly recommend it. I ended up giving it to somebody on the Maui retreat, but uh, I would like to get that back in my hands. Well, Lawrence, I've been working a lot with Lawrence lately, and he has been sharing that same philosophy with the ability to repattern yourself in running. It's the same thing it's with the body down. and the mind. Like in order to repattern, we have to slow down because when we slow down, so let's just talk about running, right? Something's going on repetitive with running. We start to slow down as far as like doing the drills that our PT or somebody like Lawrence, our mobility coach is giving us. You see the dysfunction. When we slow down. The same thing with swimming. They're like, I can't swim that slow. Right. You can't swim that slow because form breaks down and it, it showcases and shines a light on your inefficiencies as a swimmer. Great. That's where we want to really get dialed in on. Same thing with the mind. When you slow down, you see, I mean, I'll use words like deficiencies or imbalances or dysfunction. You'll see that stuff. And so to think like, 
just journaling uh, is your mind training or pushing through a hard workout is your mind training or positive affirmations is your mind training. Like that stuff all helps. It really, it does. It's, those are helpful tools and tools and techniques, but those are tools and techniques. The actual slowing down is going to happen by stopping, by ceasing movement and moving into stillness. And you'll, you'll see, you'll see what, you'll see what's brewing under the surface. I, I, I hope it's, I hope what you see is wonderful. Um, I think some of it, it won't be so wonderful, but that's okay. Cause anybody who has walked this path, anybody who has sat and gotten still, anybody who has committed to sit and meditate and be still with their thoughts has found the same. I guarantee it. We've all found the same. You find anger, you find judgment, you find sadness. Yeah. Goodies. Unworthiness. Goodies. Goodies in there. All that stuff. That's I keep going back to the Gita, but this is the story of Arjuna, the greatest warrior of all time. Like the whole Gita is about him overcoming everything that's keeping him from his tourist nature. And he's already the greatest warrior of all time. Like who he's going to be when he figures out who he is, is going to be, you know, beyond. And that's the truth for all of us. Um, so our wedding anniversary, <laughs> you want to just jump? Let's jump. Let's jump. 20 years. So... It's your year. Can you explain what that means? Every year we trade off who is responsible for planning the anniversary. And it doesn't, there's no hard guidelines on how the anniversary has to be. It just, it just sort of comes into play. But each year it trades off. So this year's my year. So I'm planning this year, whatever it is. Planning or no planning, it's planning. But I think one year we both raced... Iron Man Cozumel together. That was my year. On our actual anniversary, we were racing. So the plan was to race an Iron Man. That was it. Um, We've done a bunch of things, but it's fun. It it goes back to our relationship where it's no hassle. (laughs) So I get the odd years. That was my year. The fifth year, we went back to Hawaii. Remember, we went back there. Back to Kauai. Went back to Kauai. Um... We stayed at the Hanalei Surfboard House. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a cool place. He's in a guy. Hanalei. He was the guy who owned it. He was oh, a he, record producer mm-hmm. for. Was it Virgin Records or? I'm trying to remember the band. Or bands. Oh, Thompson, wasn't Thompson it Twins. Thompson Twins. Yeah. Or, or Millie Vanilli. No, nope, Thompson, Thompson Twins. Twins. Really cool guy. Really cool place. Simon. Um, he was from Simon. The, yes. He was from London. He Hanalei was, Surfboard House. A record exec, and then. I wonder if he's still around. He lived... Last I looked, he had the... the in Hanalei. The place there. Yeah, super cool place. So that was one year. Uh, what else did we do? Oh my God, we've done lots of things. I think... I can't remember. We've done... Nights Away. We've done couples massages Castle in Hill. Hot Springs. We've done... Castle Hill. I think I got Castle Hill one time. We had dinner and we got to stay in one of the beach houses... Yeah, we've done lots of fun things. And then there's been a lot where we've done nothing, like nothing, like go get a cup of coffee. And so when it's not your year, like, okay, so it's not my year this year. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to do anything. Nothing. I just, I just get, tell you what we're doing. Yeah. And I get to receive whatever that is. If that, if your plan is that we walk down to Lefty Coffee and we get a coffee and that's all we do and we take a nap and it feels like every day, then that's what I get to receive. And that's that that's your year. Um, if it's something else, then I get to receive that, but I don't have to do anything, no card, no nothing. And we just wanted to, we actually started this when we were dating, but we just wanted to take away that, like, well, I thought you were going to make reservations. Well, it's our anniversary. Well, you know, last time I did all the planning, we wanted to like remove any opportunity of any of that in our relationship. And so I thought this was fun to just take it every other year. And so 20 years into marriage and 26 years into being together, it's worked. 97? 25, 26. 25, yeah. And the really good thing about this year is we backed it up the day after our anniversary with a nothingness day. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we are doing that. So we've got the anniversary and then the next day is a nothingness day. <laughs> That's good. That's good planning right there. I like that. I'm ready to receive. So if you're asking me what I have planned, I don't know yet. I'm not asking you. I know. 
We'll see. We'll Let's see what the day brings. You want to talk about bike camp? Yeah, we can talk about bike camp. I mean, there's a myriad of topics we can talk about. My new blanket. Oh my God, my new blanket. Uh, so BJ got a new blanket <laughs> and I got a bike trainer. That's right. It's on its way. At the launch of this, you should have it. But yeah, you got you have entered the world of back into the world of training, but entering the world of smart trainers. Yeah, I mean, this was a, a decision I have been thinking about for years, like years. It's it's a big piece of equipment to bring into our house. I, and I was laying in bed last night before I went to sleep, and I was just like, okay, could we still move out of here in a day? Could we still put everything into our car? Yes, we could. I mean, we'd have to probably give some things away, but we're still, I think we're still doing okay. This is just a really big piece of equipment to bring into the house. But what did I get? The Wahoo Kicker Core on sale. I grabbed, I snagged the opportunity to get that. Um, yeah, it's going to be perfect for you in what you want to do. It's it's not the Wahoo Kicker, the thing that I've had been lugging around. <laughs> it's like really heavy. <laughs> but this is going to get the job done for you. You're going to get a uh, an account with Trainer Road, which is what we use most often, and we're going to get you on uh, on the trainer here and get you going into bike camp. So that kind of transitions us into bike camp. Uh, really going to do. Um, a focus for our team, you included, six to eight weeks of dedicated riding to raise our FTP numbers and to get really strong on the bike, which means roughly five to seven bike rides a week. Um, Running and swimming take a back seat. They're going to come down a little bit. And uh, rides will be no more than, I think, most rides will be under an hour to an hour. Uh, maybe one ride longer, but it's really going to be quality work on the bike. None of this uh, spinning easy. These are going to be really quality sessions. Um, but it's a hyper focused six to eight week program, and we'll come out the other side and have a, a renewed sort of relationship with the bike. Because there's a few people on our team who are just getting started with triathlon and they just went through their first year riding a bike. They're learning how to ride a bike, literally how to clip in, how to descend, all the skills you need to, to, to bike. So this is a great opportunity to, to get them really strong on the bike. And when you're strong on the bike, you get confident on the bike. And that translates to moving outside. When you know that you can shift around, you know that you can move the pedals, you know that you can climb, you feel stronger, then the outside is, is a little bit more easy to adapt to. So this bike camp is for the team, for a team for the athletes that mm-hmm. train with uh, you and, and Daniel for triathlon. And what is it like? It sounds like it's spanning from people who are literally just learned to ride a bike this year to what, like experienced mm-hmm. Ironman. And it's good to hear that it's only going to be like a couple hours a day because, as you know, I'm finishing up a m- massive project and every thing I do in a day, it, I also need to save room, make room for this project. So to think about bike camp, you're just like, oh my God, I'm going to be on the bike like five hours a day. I'm not going to be able, I'm going to get far behind. I'm going to get stressed out, but you're not going to set us up that way. Are you? No, it's a short period of time. Five rides required, you know, would be ideal and seven rides, you know, two optional rides to go the extra distance. Cause you know, we have Athletes that want to do a little bit more and probably a double ride day, which means that there's a day where you don't ride. So, um, yeah, it's just, it's, if you haven't experienced as a triathlete focusing on one sport, it's really fun. It's really fun. Uh, I've actually removed running from my, my routine for the past two weeks and just focusing on swimming and, and mostly swimming, but a little bit of cycling has it feels really good on the body and you've done the opposite. You've done just running focus and have shifted away from cycling and swimming for a while. <laughs> it didn't feel so good on the didn't body. It didn't feel so good, but it was fun to get into that. Like all I need to do is lace up my shoes or when we would travel, you're like, all I need is my shoes and oh, my pack. Oh God. Yeah. Just being like, just 
being a runner, like running trails or running the road, like, yeah, it was like, all I need is my snakes and my, and my pack. So yeah, now it's like all the freaking regalia everywhere we go, the bike, the helmet, the blah, 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 all the stuff, like all the big show. And we have, (laughs) we're minimalists. So we have one bike, one helmet, you know, one pair of bike shoes. It's like, and that is still stacking up in a, in a bigger car that we have. I know. I have one. I've been working off a one long sleeve shirt now for several years. I don't even have, I do not own a long sleeve shirt. That's just like a shirt. I just have. Is it the gray Lululemon? And I have this gray Lululemon, the swiftly Lululemon long sleeve. It's a little bit looser. It's not like their skin tight one. And I've been living on that thing for years now. I think like, I actually, I don't even know. Like it, I maybe got that right after we moved here, but that's it. I realized like, I don't, I mean, I have a sweatshirt, like a, a hoodie that has sleeves and I have a s- couple sweaters that have sleeves, but I don't have a long sleeve shirt, but I'm doing good with this one. But I went riding with some girls yesterday and they had like, one had like a really pretty purple long sleeve shirt. One had a really pretty pink long sleeve shirt. I was like, and I had on my gray, somewhat stretched out. I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe this one's starting to run the course, but I think I'd probably donate that one and bring in the new one, which is, which is typically what we do now. Um, still donating clothes. I like to, I, I still like to shop and get new things. Um, but I'm donating things on the other end of that. And so the hardest thing is that everything I'm donating is like stuff I love and I wear. Oh, so that's tough. It's constant letting go. So yeah, I'm excited for bike camp. I am. I love riding my, I love riding my bike. I love riding my road bike at triathlons. I love it. It's just, feels simple and fun and um and I'm doing Oceanside this year so I'm excited. I haven't done that one yet. I'm excited for Oceanside. I'm excited to stay a little bit more local. Oh my god, we traveled so much. We, I mean, we're going to Costa Rica. We're That's true. Going to possibly Finland and Kona again. <laughs> but in the near future, near future, we're st- staying by camp. Yeah, by camp and then Oceanside. <laughs> staying staying close to home. And camp. We have our camp coming up. January 12th through the 16th. So if you want to uh, see what it feels like to be in the Yogi Triathlete community, you're not already on the team, come and join us. It will also give you a little bit of an idea of what it's like to kind of be on retreat with us. Although camp is like, camp is is a big load. I mean, it's training plus all the things we do on retreat, yoga, meditation, cacao, all that stuff. Making pizza. I think we have a pizza night, right? Yeah, we're going to have a welcome party doing a pizza night. I haven't finalized the schedule. I had I know, a, a new inspiration that um, I'm seeing where I can work it in on the on the schedule. Uh, but we have a really, really nice group of people who are coming together, men and women, and it's based here in Carlsbad. And so we've got some spots left, and we'd love for anyone who's – you know, it's kind of been on your heart or you've heard about it the last couple of years and you think, oh, that could be a cool thing to do, but I'm not quite sure how to make it all work. Like, let us know. Let us help you talk through it. And if these words have maybe entered your, like you vocalize these words, like I'm thinking about coming. Right. Seriously considering? Seriously considering or thinking <laughs> We've about We've heard that coming. so many times. I was seriously, I, I, was like, <laughs> I wonder if people are seriously con- still considering coming to Maui because it's over. Maui came and it's gone. <laughs> Maui was such a good teacher. So what is the, what is, what is at the root of that you think when? I think it's, I think, so I think that when opportunity comes, this is what happens with me. Opportunity comes or an inspiration comes. I sit with it. I kind of know immediately like what, what way it's leaning more towards, but I'll sit with it, but not long. I'll sit with it for like a couple of days and then a decision is made, whether it's a yes, whether it's a no, whether it's a huh, maybe for the future. And then, but I'm not chewing on it. Like, oh, I'm seriously considering it. I want to do it. I don't know how to do it. I want to do it. I want to do it. Um, I think that's where we get 
into that decision fatigue or we're overthinking it or we're talking ourselves out of something that we really want to do or talking ourselves into something that really isn't aligned for us. So I think getting to know like what, what it feels like inside, you kind of know, and it doesn't take that long to make choices. What do you think? Well, coming from someone who really over has been an overthinker and has a pattern of delay. And also you don't want to give the response that you really feel. Like, you know, you're not going to go, but it's, you're leaving that option as filling it with like, well, I'm seriously considering it. Oh, instead of just saying no, instead I don't just say no, I don't want to go because mm-hmm. no is, is most often not an acceptable answer. Right. Oh, if you I say no it. to something, people are like, Oh, why not? Like, Oh, you should come. Like we're all going to be there. But when you say yes, there's never a question as to why you said yes. I love this topic. No is acceptable. No is completely acceptable. And I think <laughs> if you're, you ask me like that, that would be something why I would say seriously considering because I don't want to tell them no, because I'm, I don't want to, I don't want to have to feel the reaction to the questions of why I'm actually not going to go because maybe it's just, I just don't feel like I want to go. Why isn't that enough? You know, so then you come up with this phrase that you're considering it. And so it, it gives them, it gives them the, a little bit of a taste of like, oh, they're still interested. So, okay. So it's a possibility. Okay. So then they don't push, push at all or, or, you know, try to, try to get more uh, meaning out of it. I think that's probably a, a big piece that I, I believe in. It's just not being able to say no or, feeling that there's going to be a, a flood of questions as to why you're not. I mean, that's maybe the karma and experience I had growing up. Like if you say no to something, it was always like, well, you better go see, you better get in the in the car and go see your grandparents. Or, like it was very, you better go. There's no excuse for not going. And so I would have to find a reason, which never really worked, um, to get out of it. Because I didn't want to go. Yeah. I mean, I started implementing the just the no in my family. And I definitely get like the, that's it. Not that You're not going to say anything else. You're just saying no. I'm like, yeah, it's just a no. It's so awkward. And you feel like, oh my God, I need to say something. But- I was just thinking friends from college, <laughs> the episode we were watching last night. Lisa was at the table. Oh yeah. And she's like, no. Friends from college reference. Oh, yeah, We've from had college. a couple listeners who have watched that Binged show. Binged it and really liked Binged it. Binged it and loved it. Two seasons, six oh my episodes. God. It's, each season. If you've binged it and loved it, you have to go back and watch it again, watch it again, watch it again, watch it again, because this brilliant writing gets unearthed and it's just the character development and the the writing is so witty and intelligent and brilliant and creative and hysterical. It's so good. But yeah, no, 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 no is a, is an acceptable answer, but it's so true, right? We're conditioned to be like, oh my God, why not? What's wrong? Did I do something? Whereas we say yes, no one says, oh my God, why? Why? Why are you coming? Why? Yes. Oh, is it something I did? We don't. It's always like, oh, oh good. And yes, then move it's on. like good. And, then, and then no. And I'm not saying like, and I've, I've talk to so many people about this and sometimes it comes back to me like when they say no and I'm like oh I have to like work with this no that they just gave me because we're so conditioned to be like I don't want it to be no I want it to be the way I want it to be well think about Daniel and you asked him to co-host the podcast what was his first answer no right and what did you reply this this, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to reconsider that that's a great (laughs) Great reply. I think that opened up the window <laughs> of possibility. And so he ended up co-hosting. Of course he did, because he's amazing. So yeah, that was the 70.3 World Championship Smackdown we just launched. Daniel was my co-host. And he, hands down, said the funniest thing on the whole episode. He's awesome. He is one of the funniest people, I will say this, one of the funniest people I've ever met. Like, cause he'll just say, it's kind of like a friends from college. He'll just say something like in the background and it is hysterical, but a lot of times it's not heard. So I'm always like listening for it now. But if if he listens to this, then he might try and be funny and then that's not going to work. Yeah, Don't try and be, just be you, Daniel. Just be you. Be you. You're hysterical. So funny. He's so witty. Very, very, very funny guy. 
Um, all right, Bite Camp, 20th anniversary. Can't wait to report back on what we did. Who knows? It could be a trip to the garden. It could be a night away with Clark. It could be anything. I'm excited to see how it all unfolds. It's probably not a trip to Hawaii. I'll tell you that much. No, I don't want to go to Hawaii. Um, not right now. Um, I, I got a weighted blanket. <laughs> That's news. I got VJ a weighted blanket. The Airbnb that we stayed at in St. George just recently had this blanket. It was a fuzzy blanket and had a little bit of weight to it. It's definitely not a weighted blanket. We yeah, have I one now. Yeah, I think it was just, it felt weighted because it was so big. Yeah. And I loved it and I slept really well up there. And so we got home and I used our comforter and folded it over twice and put that on top of me. And that was good for a little while. Then Jess splurged and got me a weighted blanket, like a legit weighted blanket. 12 pounds. Fuzzy on one side. It's awesome. So now I have the fuzzy, now I have my sheets, the comforter. Oh my God. The weighted blanket. And then I have the other comforter folded in two on top of that. And now I'm sleeping with socks and I'm sleeping with pajamas. My variety. I have no pajamas. idea. I would like <laughs> the bed. It would be like burning bed. If that, if I was under all that, that would not work. It would not work. I would be way too hot, but I am getting a little play of the, a little bit of the weighted blanket. Um, I usually get a little short sheeted through the night. Compliments of my husband and my dog. 70 pound Now dog. that it's chilly out at night, Clark sleeps on the bed with us. So I typically get short sheeted. And it's uh, it's a practice. I used to get really upset and mad about that, but now I just kind of laugh because you guys are so cute. <laughs> but I'm, <laughs> I can laugh it off now. Yeah. I used to get very angry, but now I laugh it off. Um, hey, we uh, we wanted to talk about uh, the expansion of Yogi Triathlete that we are oh, right. looking for somebody to join us. Yeah, we're looking for another coach. We're looking for a coach, probably preferably that triathlon and running, I would say, uh, would be a good fit. Um, we're growing. We are expanding. Yogi Triathlete is, is not going away. Uh, we're only uh, thriving um, as a coaching business and as a, as a community. So we want to keep it very targeted to our athletes. We, we, we want to stay in this realm of giving attention to our athletes and celebrating their own unique individuality and preparing workouts and conversations and, and events that match their goals and their opportunities for growth. And in order to do that, each coach needs to keep a limited number. Well, they determine what feels good for them in their life. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, like Coach Liz has a full roster right now. She's got a number that feels really good to her. And if she decides to take on more, we'll open her back up. If she, if she decides to, you know, even make it smaller, that's like we just support them in, in what works the best so that they can show up to be their best as they're also navigating their own training in their own life. But we are at a point now where um, we would love to welcome on another coach. And so if you know somebody, if it's you, um, you know, let's just start the conversation. If you're listening to this, you know what we're about. And that is um, what we're about is not changing. <laughs> So, um, but also another thing is we could put you in touch with our current coaches, which I'm sure I can speak on their behalf, that they would be happy to talk to anybody who's maybe thinking about coming on here so they can let you know what it's like to work with us as the owners of the business. I think that's a great idea. You know, somebody outside of you and me, although we're prepared and ready to talk to anyone if you have questions, but if you want to reach out to Daniel or Liz and see what the experience has been like, they've been with us for years, uh, reach out to them and, and see if it's a good fit for you. We're, we want to grow this community. We, we, we believe firmly in the mix of coaching that we provide for our athletes and support. And this mix has a element of going beyond what you have defined for yourself and really 
nurturing the growth of you to, to step outside that box and environment to, to, to really just like shine. Mm. And I think all of us, or well, I know all of us believe that. We believe in all our athletes that they have the potential and possibility to achieve everything they want. So if that sounds good to you, like you're listening to this and like, oh my God, like this is the opportunity I've been waiting for, or you're, you're curious about it, but you just don't quite know how it's going to unfold, have a conversation. Reach out to either Jess or myself and have a conversation or Liz and Daniel. And I think that's your first step. Yeah, absolutely. But we are... We are, yeah, we're open for that person, that coach to come into our lives. So, um, yeah, I'm excited to see how it unfolds and who comes in. Um, you know, right now it's Chef Linda who runs our plant-based nutrition program. She's available and taking on athletes. Daniel is our a triathlon coach. He's taking on athletes. BJ triathlon running. Uh, he's taking on athletes, but your roster is getting mm-hmm. pretty, like it's it's starting to get pretty full. And and uh, and Liz is full, and it's amazing. And so um, yes, we're excited to continue to grow and expand, and we'll just see how this all unfolds. But I f- thought this would be the first, the best first place to drop it. Well, this is how we got Linda to yeah. help us out. <laughs> yeah, I love it. All right. I'm going to the pool. Do we have time? Yeah, we got time. What do you mean we All have right. time? We got plenty of time. All right, let's do it. We were, we were like on time for this podcast, and now we're going to go to the pool, and it's going to be awesome. Recovery swim. I need a recovery swim. Both of us. I feel like I did a race yesterday. I went out and did a three-hour trail run with some girlfriends, which felt like 15 minutes. We had so much fun. Ran like almost 14 miles. And I haven't done that since the last time I went out with these ladies in like June or July. And uh, I wasn't really thinking that the trail that I took them to has a lot of like hefty downhills. And so my quads are ripped. And it's awesome. A good swim will shake him out. Oh my god, I'm loving it. I feel like I did a race yesterday. I'm like, my legs are torched. It's good times though. Good times. All right. Thanks for joining us. Bye.